It's a pleasure to be here. This is my second Pelicon. I was here, I think it must be three years ago now, in my last sort of Easter holiday as a teacher. So I've only been at Roehampton two and a half years now, having a whale of time working with, oh, probably about 1,100 people who are training to be teachers. So what I'm going to do this morning is, is sort of work my way around the loop there in half an hour or so, tell you a little about the students that I work with, talk a bit about one of our courses, one of the modules that we work on, and then tell you a bit about our blogging journey. Who here is using blogs with the learners that they work with? Or using, okay, so just, just one, okay, this is going to, hopefully then, that's covering some reasonably new territory for many of you. So our first, uh, our first footsteps into blogging using Blogger, and then what we've done since then using our own bespoke platform developed in Drupal, tell you about some of the big ideas, some of the d decisions we made about the design, show you some of the bits of the system, some of the statistics, examples of how students have used it, some of the comments they've made, and sort of overall evaluation. What we've done this last year and then where we're heading next. So we have a diverse group. As I say, oh, I'll turn the speaker off. There we go. Um, as I say, about 1,100 students in total, two programs, the BA Primary Education, which has got about 300 in each year, it's a three-year course, and then another 300 or so on our PGC program. Uh, myself and my team work with them on the ICT bits of education, um, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. But we have a huge spread of ability. This is a, sum a summation of how they do on our ICT skills audit. So we give them a list of 17 things and say grade yourself on a four-point scale on each of these things. And we have some who come very, very low down that particular bell curve and some who are way at the top there. So there are huge issues in terms of differentiation, personalizing the learning experience because of their prior experience, their confidence with technology when they join us. When we get into the detail of that, the picture is pretty much what you would expect. Down the bottom of the graph there, we have the things which they feel very confident about, a degree of expertise they would even own to, and then things up at the top of the graph, the programming, um, using data logging, working with interactive whiteboards of which after school or after their first university course they've not had a huge amount of experience with confidence in. I'm going to put the slides, the slides are up online so don't feel you have to take photos of them, I'll put some of the others up. So as well as that spread of skills, we also I think have three quite distinct learning styles involved. We have a large number of our students who like to just play, to explore, to learn through discovery. We have a number who like to read stuff and to, to have instructions there or to be you know, given, given a set of, of you know, the, the help files or the YouTube walkthroughs about what to do when it comes to skills. And also a number who like to have somebody there sitting alongside helping them, somebody talking to them about that. I quite like a sort of show of hands. Think about how you learn stuff on a computer or learn to do stuff with a computer. If you could pick one of the three, which would you be in? Who here would, would just like to learn through exploration, experiment, play? Thank you very much. Through having the help file, the manual, the instructions? OK. And through having somebody to talk to to work with them on that? That's really interesting. Thank you very much at the back there. We asked the same question to our students, and of course the correct answer is it depends. But 42% of them say, let me just play, let me just explore, let me just discover. So when it comes to sort of workshop sessions, we want to make some provision for that. We want to give them the opportunity to do that, and thus concentrate our time on working perhaps more with those who do like to have that support, that person to talk to about it. And that's influenced some of the decisions about our course delivery. We deal with the three middle tiers in this big picture stuff. Our good friends over in e-learning deal with students' ICT in terms of their experience as a student, ICT for studying. And our colleagues in each of the other subject areas deal with that sort of subject-specific type of ICT education. So we're interested in how, how a person becoming a teacher would use ICT generally in their teaching, how students, how pupils in school would use ICT for learning, and then what's left of the ICT curriculum, at least for a little while longer, those four particular areas of learning which, which are still part of the primary national curriculum for another four months or so. 
The course for our postgraduate students is very, very short, sharp to the point, and we take those aspects of the ICT curriculum and sort of use those as pegs to hang things off. So we'll spend some time dealing with interactive whiteboards, we look at how to use the web well, how to use the web, web safely in that second lecture, we do some work on um, working with images, so paint programs and taking photographs. Then we spend some time doing the, the media work, working with audio, working with video. And then finally, we bring in the programming stuff and playing with the toys for the last lecture of the course. Each of those is a sort of three-hour workshop session. But we don't, uniquely amongst our modules, make them come to the whole of the session. The first part of the session is something which they get to do independently if they want. So we've tried to sort of build in that differentiation, personalizing it in terms of learning styles by allowing them to work at home, to work in their accommodation, to work up in the library for the first part of the session or to do that work however they want to. Put it up online, let other people see that. And then the second half of the lecture is the sort of plenary stuff. And then that first part of the lecture, we're there, we're available to help them if they want to come in for that and do that with a little bit more support than they would do, than they might necessarily need some of them. Okay, so a couple of years ago, now my first year at Roehampton, we had a go at using the blog as a portfolio, as a way of capturing the stuff that was going on in that first part of the lecture, that first hour and a half or so, and it worked reasonably well. Everybody completed the course, 100% success rate, which was a relief. There did seem to be evidence of increased reflection. A couple of criticisms, there wasn't really much sense of them supporting one another through that, and at Roehampton we believe very much that education is is a social process. And also we ran into a few technical difficulties down to um, the blogger system that we were using. So, you know, some of the sort of summative reflection at the end of the course, that's nice. I think that's nice as well, that it was seen as more relevant than keeping a file or keeping a folder of this stuff. But not everybody was happy. And I think in many ways a fair criticism that, you know, it was just stuff which they had to do in order to pass the course. There wasn't really that sort of sense of engaging with the bloggers as a place to, to do things because they were interesting to do. We also, as I say, had some problems with blogger. So pretty much all of our students got an email like this. Your blog has been identified as a potential spam blog. To correct this, please request a review by filling in the form, which was unhelpful of dear old blogger to send all of these emails out. So they you know, duly requested the review, and then pretty much everybody got one of these. Your blog has been reviewed and confirmed as in terms of service for violation non. Um, in accordance with these terms, we've removed the blog and the URL is no longer accessible. Charming, isn't it? Okay, actually, you know, given that this is assessed work, this is a directed task, you know, we're kind of supposed to be able to tick a box here to say they've done this. To find that blogger had decided to just delete all of their accounts was, was unhelpful, we felt. And uh, you know, in fact, once they got this email, the blogs were actually marked as absolutely fine. The key word there is non. But um, dear old Google, bless them, <laughs> just got a generic email which they sent to everybody. And, you know, sometimes that means it's been deleted, sometimes it doesn't. So big picture stuff. Who recognizes the man in the picture? Thank you very much. Is it just you, Steve? It is Vygotsky, absolutely. And, you know, Roehampton, I, I work at Roehampton University, I'm a social constructivist. You know, I was asked at interview, how would you teach this if you were adopting a social constructivist paradigm? So we we're unashamedly social constructivist in our approach. We believe that language is essential to the learning process and that students learn very well through communication with one another, through working inside their zones of proximal development, rather than just listening to us lecture like what I'm doing at the moment. Over in ICT education, we're also very, very impressed by the man in the beard here. Anybody? You recognize the man in the picture? I'm Go on. Seymour Paffert, well done, gold star, right? Sorry, old teacher habits die hard. <laughs> so we also move from the sort of social constructivist view which the whole of the program takes to our more constructionist picture that we actually think that students learn very, very well through making things for other people to see this notion of the public artifact. And so that underpins a lot of what we do. We're impressed by Wenger's notion of learning as a social process. The program does things very, very well over on the left hand side here. Learning is experience, learning through making meaning is pretty much what um, HEI based teacher training is all about. Learning through practice, we send them off into school and they do the job of a teacher and reflect on that. The top the top right corner over there, we kind of hope that that happens by and large. This sense of 
identity of becoming a teacher is something which we, we hope happens through the process without us necessarily dealing with that explicitly. Our hope was with the blogging that we would see more of that as they're reflecting on this journey from student to teacher. And also this sense of participating in a professional community, in a community of practice, this sense of learning as belonging. I'm shocked that we still have students who are sent out into school where they're not allowed in the staff room because that surely is an important part of this learning journey that they're engaged on. And of course, more interesting new stuff, George Siemens and construct, sorry, um, connectivism, that um, knowledge continues to grow and evolve. What is access to what is needed is more important than what the learner currently possesses. And then the notion of the personal learning network, that that's an essential part of the learning journey. So, bearing in mind our blogger stuff, bearing in mind those sort of big picture priorities, these were what we decided we needed to do with our new system. We wanted to have control of it. We wanted it to run on basically our servers that we could do whatever we wanted with it. We didn't want emails coming in from whoever our provider was saying, this blog has been marked as spam and will be deleted. We also wanted to emphasize very much the social dimension of this, that the students would pretty much by default see what one another were writing on and be encouraged to comment on what one another were writing. This leads us down a sort of more technical journey that we needed to have support for tagging so we could map against QTS standards, which kind of matter in our line of work. We wanted support for commenting on blog posts. We wanted them to be able to share those artifacts with one another. Attachments were a really important part of this process. It wasn't just the reflection, it was showing people what you'd done. And we also have this very strong sense of identity to our teaching groups, and we needed to perpetuate that. A few other things on the desirable list. It needed to support informal learning as well as the more formal. It needed to be something which was relatively simple for students to learn how to use, given that large bell curve of skill distribution. We wanted it to be easy for us to read what they were putting to be able to comment on that. We wanted a system of notifications so that we'd know, so that they'd know when one another had posted things. This is the interesting one in light of what Alec Kuros was talking about yesterday. We felt that it needed to be essentially a private system where they could say what they wanted within a trusted group of friends to one another. So we took a decision to blog privately inside a walled garden, and that's something I want to return to in the last few minutes or so. We also wanted to be able to do some fairly sophisticated analytics and reporting on what we did. So that took us down the open source route. We had a number of options to consider. Dear old Moodle, which is the university's virtual learning environment, in its then incarnation 1.9, wouldn't do what we wanted. Mahara looked as though it would, but I don't know, who's using Mahara here? Do you find it an easy thing to teach, to use? Yeah. The learning curve seemed incredibly steep, and the notion of spending our first lecture explaining how to use Mahara and set up views and to set up groups themselves seemed not an efficient use of our time. So we kind of discounted Mahara. I know Elg of old, um, but a little bit too sort of techy and complicated to set up these days. So we're down to Drupal and BuddyPress. Um, Drupal went out in the end because of the reporting, um, this ability to set up your own custom sort of views of the data which Drupal collected seemed to have the advantage. I think we made the right decision, but I am hugely impressed by BuddyPress, and I think it could have gone either way very comfortably there. But for you know, other reasons than merely the sort of student experience, we went with Drupal in the end. So this is what it looks like. It's not that exciting. I'm very sorry, people who were expecting to see lots of sort of bright primary colors or whatever. We have a sort of trad three column layout. Front page of it is very much the students' posts. And the focus of the whole platform is what the students are saying about their work, about what they're reading, about what they're doing, and sharing those comments, those reflections, those artifacts with one another. We have other stuff on the side. So you've got a menu system down on the left here, and over on the right-hand side, all of the groups which they're members of, which start, of course, with their main sort of teaching and learning groups. Creating a blog entry as a doddle, they put a title in, they pick a QTS standard, which does the sort of portfolio type stuff. There's a chance for them to keyword this stuff. Um, and then they just 
you know, type stuff, really. <laughs> you, know, you, you know how these systems work. And, of course, down the bottom of the page there, which I can't show you, the support for attaching pretty much any file that they want to these sorts of things. We've got some embedded media support as well. This is the view for one of our PGC groups. So this would be a typical student's home page when they get into the Blogfolio system. They see that sort of river of news of what the other people in their groups have said. They also, of course, have their own blog. Uh, at the moment, there's no sort of customization or personalization there using the sort of default theme that we set up for them. I'll pause briefly and take questions or comments at this point. I have, yeah, I've no experience to compare it to. We emphasise very much in the first lecture that they are writing for an audience and the audience is the other people in the room with them. I think that's very helpful when it comes to their writing, that we don't require it to be an academic type of writing. They're very much writing for other people they're becoming teachers. And you know, when we talk about reflection, our sort of mantra is the what, so what, and the now what. That they don't need to actually, when it's stuff which we've covered in lectures, workshops, talk about the what, because everybody's been there. The interesting stuff is the so what, what does this mean to me? And the now what, how does this impinge on my, my future plan of professional practice? So I think that that sort of sense of, it's not just for myself and not just for my tutor that I'm writing, is a big advantage to, to blogging, however you're going to do that. Um, for us, the, the learning curve, because they know one another in the group, they know who their audience is, that seems, I think, more accessible and, it could be anybody out in the world, but I'm really interested with anybody out in the world as, as an alternative to this, which we might come back to later. How do you check off the individual standards? Standard? I'll come to that in, that's, that's one of the things we've added in since. And again, that's one of the advantages of Drupal is because of that tagging system, we've got all of that, we can do the reporting against that, which would have been harder, but by no means impossible, using BuddyPress. Hi. How Oh, you know, it's, I mean, the, Drupal is, is an open source content management system. It download it, put it onto a web server somewhere, and you're pretty much ready to get going. Getting it working how we wanted it to, I think it was sort of four or five days of my time initially, and then sort of two or three days later on in the year tweaking it, and two or three days this year getting it sort of tickety-boo. So, you know, time, but not vast amounts of time, and certainly something which one can do oneself if one's sufficiently interested to learn how to do it, you know. Handing it over to e-learning saying, make it so, has some advantages in terms of time, but this feels very much as it's something which we own, and it's, it's a bespoke system. It's tailored exactly to what we wanted it to do, rather than something which we sort of bought off the peg and, and made our practice fit into that. Anything else before I go on? Hi. In terms of what they wrote, um, for some of our modules, yes. For the big PGC reflective practice module, no. They have to do it. It's directed task stuff. They can do it very well, or they can just do it very, very perfunctory. They still get the box ticked to say they've done the work. I have problems with that, but that's the way we, we run things. For some of our modules that we're using this on, the quality of the reflection, the quality of the comments that they make becomes part of the assessed component of the work. And so, yes, we do have assessment criteria for that. And I think, you know, off the top of my head, these are about it has to be reflective. It's not enough for it merely to be descriptive. You need to start you know, engaging with the theory and putting in links to, to things which are related to what you're writing about there. I could pull off the list. If you send me an email later, I'll, I'll let you have a copy of this. Right. Very good question. Again, that's one of the things we've added on since because of student feedback requesting that exactly that feature. So um, coming up towards the end of the presentation. Over the first year we were using this, we had over a million words. So anybody who's expecting a detailed qualitative analysis of student blog posts, I'm sorry, over a million words is far too much for me to read. <laughs> so you know, there's a huge amount of stuff captured in the system 
there. And I would love to find some very, very clever way of being able to get the computer to help with the analysis of what they've written, rather than merely the fact that they have written. 615 users, because we only start, we started with our new first year cohort, rather than changing everybody mid-course, together with our post-grad co cohort that year. We have well, there's nine people who didn't post anything, and we think that many of those were people who sort of dropped off the course. They, they came, registered, logged in, and then decided teaching wasn't for them. And better to find out that sooner rather than later. And, you know, a fairly sort of typical long-tail distribution. The peaks there are the students who've done exactly what is required of them and no more. They have posted something for each of the sort of directed tasks and used it as an assessment portfolio. But it's gratifying to see that many more did more than the minimum required of them. Hi there. Oh, labeling the axes. That's yes. so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, over here is the horizontal axis is the number of blog posts per user. So this data point here is how many students posted 10 times. Um, this poor person over here, which is probably me, I think they actually stripped me out of this, they posted 65 times during the course of the year. I think I know who that is. Some people really got carried away with this. I'm hoping that they're going to be the ones who blog publicly. So what is that? 7,289 posts over the course of the first year. You'll notice a dip over the Christmas holiday. It's very much linked to the stuff that we're doing during the course rather than they're blogging for the fun of it. And this is, you know, the, the, the disadvantage to this sort of approach. And then some huge peaks. I think that was one of our very busy teaching days there. This is the sort of thing they wrote about, dear old Wordle. Isn't that lovely for people who are trained to be primary school teachers? That word, you know, comes up more than any other in the analysis there. I think that's wonderful. I really do. And then the commenting, not as much as we'd have liked in the first year, and we've sort of tweaked things to encourage more of that since. And this is an even more typical long tail distribution. It bothers me that, what is that, 110 people didn't comment on anybody else's work at all. I think we build that into the directed task type stuff and require that. This is me down this, I'm commenting 290 times on students. Post. I only really I didn't comment on everything, I didn't invite feedback to everybody. I just commented on stuff which was interesting or that I disagreed with or that I wanted other people to, to read about. This is a student book. We have one student who got really into the, well, more than one student who got really into this, but really sort of engaging with what other people had written, commenting on what they were writing too. And this is even better, I think, as a word of these are the sorts of things which they put in their comments rather than their original posts. Again, children at the center, but I love that word, think, up at the top there. And agree comes up more than disagree. Anybody like to figure out what's in the picture here? Not link backs, you're on the right track. It's to do with comments. This is who comments on whom. So taking just one of our PGC groups, about 30 students, less than 30 students, who's commenting on whom? Here, it's interesting. Student 108 commenting a number of times on their own posts. I think in response to comments they were receiving from others. So you have people who are real sinks of comments. So student number 90, uh, and we don't actually refer to those numbers in the first time. Like, pay some time. <laughs> this is somebody who's obviously saying some really interesting things. And lots of people commenting on what they're saying. Other students have sort of taken a more mixed approach to this. Have commenting a lot on what other people are saying but also getting lots of comments themselves. There is one on here, student 89, uh, sort of middle at the top there, who commented once on somebody else's post and received no comments on their own. That's so sad. And of course, this year, being aware of this, we tried to do sort of more early interventions and to, to track that sort of stuff, student by student. And I wish now we had, I noticed that sooner and done something about student 89 and saying, okay, you know, let's start adding some more comments into that myself as a way of encouraging. How are we doing for time? Okay, um, some of their work, so we make them do sort of you know, creative pieces, creative tasks and post that. Um, they talk a little about their own personal experience about learning with ICT. This one generated a lot of comments. 
They also think about practice in schools, so this is responding to Ofsted's report and some of the comments on that. Uh, we make them watch the usual sorts of videos, so the Ken Robinson one about do schools create, kill creativity. There's some lovely, reflective, interesting, insightful things coming up there, even though they could have got away with just writing a paragraph or two. I think because they were seeing what others were writing and that sense of upping their game because of what one another were doing. Again, practice in school. Um, we make our first year students go and video themselves on their first placement or get, have themselves videoed and reflect on that and post those videos up for other people to see. And then some lovely stuff which wasn't part of the requirements, just blogging for the sake of it because I've got in something interesting to say. So Mark there on a placement um, where they happen to have an Ofsted inspection. It said that the Queen thinks everything smells of fresh paint and I sometimes wonder whether the same can be said of Ofsted inspectors. It's a great post. And lovely that he wanted to do that to share that with everybody else in his group rather than because he had to. On the whole, they liked it. Not everybody did. We had a number of people who really weren't at all happy with being made to engage with the course in this sort of way. Most of the feedback we got was very positive. And that's nice. Some of the groups got really very excited about this and started using this in a sort of self-organizing way. They found that they could use the system for things that we'd never intended it to be used for. So this notion of sharing lesson plans, sharing resources through the system that we'd set up, we were delighted to see this happen. And then, you know, great ideas for let's carry on using it next year, which they haven't. They've got Facebook, though. And then this sort of thing. <laughs> this is one of the strongly disagrees. And again, we still have this thing about, you know, because it's part of the course requirements, it feels as though we're just sort of ticking boxes. Um, not for everybody, but certainly for some, that's how it seemed. And again, nobody's listening. This could be student 89. <laughs> um, and some of this is our fault. We've got a team teaching the, the module. We could have been clearer about this. But, you know, this, isn't, this is actually quite a helpful sort of criticism that we should be using this for things other than just ICT education, that there's, it's more powerful than just how we're using technology in school. So what have we done since? Um, I'm starting to do this lecture casting thing of putting up the recording of the lecture afterwards, not quite flipping the lecture room here, so that that's on Blogfolio for them to look back on. And that seems to be going down well. Um, We've moved it onto some other programs too. So my colleague who teaches the secondary history PGC, really excited about what it can do. So she's using it sort of um, across her whole program for secondary history PGC, and that's going very, very well. So it's not just for ICT anymore. We've got the mobile phone interface, of course. Everybody has to have a mobile phone interface now. And that seems to have gone down quite well as well. Not so much for posting from the mobile. That might be the next thing. But um, sort of reading one another's posts on the phone. Uh, we've added in the almost ubiquitous, it's not linked to Facebook, but as a way of, sometimes they want to say this is a really interesting post, but don't have time to write the comments on there. So we've got a little like voting thing in, which actually helps from our point of view of a way of sort of saying, these are the interesting posts. These are the ones which we want to share across the whole program rather than just with the group themselves. So things which we've added on um, this year, we have this My Files thing now so they can look at all of the stuff which they've uploaded there. Um, Rose, you asked about the export. We've added that in now so that they click on that or right click that link, save it as, produces a well formatted RSS XML file which they could import into a personal WordPress blog or take with them to many other systems but not absolutely everything. It won't import into Blogger but it will import into WordPress. So. I think that's probably a good thing, actually. <laughs> um, and then the QTS mapping, which somebody asked about earlier. So you click on the link, and it shows all of the posts which they've tagged against each QTS statement. So that's a number tagged against QTS, double O QTS statement one, and that will carry on through. Of course, QTS statements are changing, so that the, the standards are moving for next September. So I've got to get my head around how do we move from one set of QTS tags to an entirely different set of statements for what it means to be a qualified teacher. The other thing which I've got to get my head around is do we move outside the walled garden? Um, and I don't have time to ask your opinion on this, but email me or tweet me. And should we start taking the risk? Should we move outside of this sort of closed, confined space where blogging amongst friends 
or should we do the stuff that Alec was talking about yesterday, I know you do at Plymouth, of, of using you know, public blog space and letting other people than just the sort of 30 or so people in the room with us and the tutors on the course read what students are saying. My thinking at the moment is that we make this an optional thing, that they get to choose. Do I want to blog just to the people in the group, just to my tutor, or do I want anybody in the world to read this? You're here at Plymouth? Yeah. You're blogging? Yeah. You're blogging publicly. What do you compare and contrast? Um, is it better the way you're doing it? I think, no, I was thinking about it just then, actually. Um, I think in some ways it's quite nice to get um, comments from people who are interested in what you're doing, but maybe Do you feel yourself constrained by the fact that it's a public blog? Are there things that you'd like to say that you feel you can't because a future employer or a place of the school class teacher could read what you put? No, I don't think I don't have that problem yet. So I'm really impressed by the different approach being taken here and I'm quite envious in many ways. So I'm wondering, I really am wondering whether to move. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's set up at the moment, so if you type in the URL, you get a page which says, in a warm, friendly sort of way, access denied. <laughs> but we've got the option to, to change that. The deal with the students has been, you're just... Yes. Yeah. 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 But no, that's, that's probably... If we are going to make that move, that's, I think, the way I would do it. Um, the other option, of course, is to give, say to students, okay, set up your own blog, give us the RSS feed, and Drupal will suck that in and populate their blog here inside the system with the stuff which they're blogging outside. So we have options. I've spoken too much, haven't I? <laughs>